Hi everyone. <laughs> My name is Chris Stewart and I am the curator of community and academic programs here at the Biggs Museum of American Art. And in case you haven't visited us in person, the Biggs Museum of American Art is located in historic downtown Dover. And we have a premier collection of both decorative and fine art ranging from the 1700s through practicing artists today. Now, this particular tour that we're gonna go on today is unique because we're actually going to be going on a virtual tour of some of the practicing artists that we work with studios. Um, so I hope you all enjoy it. As we get going, um, this particular program today is set up a little bit differently than some of our other virtual programs if you've visited us before or you've participated in some of our virtual programs. This, um, this particular program, we have some segments that are pre-recorded that we'll show you. We're gonna be talking at the same time and we'll be live and pre-recorded and going back and forth. Um, one second. We're going to go ahead and get started with our tour. Hi, I'm Taylor Collins, and I'm um, glad to be welcoming the virtual tour today for the, that is sponsored by the Bigs. And my gallery is um, Port Green Galleries in Dover, Delaware, and I'm in Taylor Collins, the uh, um, artist who is the owner of this now. And um, so we're gonna have a little tour of the space and what I do and what we have offered here. And um, the, um, you can tell from, like when you walk in, it's kind of a little bit of everything. So my work has been um, for like 35 or 36 years now. And I started out doing the folk art and then I progressed into um, Impressionism when I studied with Jack Lewis, who was a WPA artist during the Depression era. And so my, and then I moved into to collage and now I'm more abstract expressionistic. And so it's been like a process. So it's kind of all here. Um, we originally started um, about seven years ago, it was four artists and because of retirements and moving away, it's down to me now. So I'm the, the main artist. And so anyway, so some of these are, most of them are plein air, um, the paintings. Um, we have a group called Plein Air Painters of the Mid-Atlantic, and we paint, um, we used to paint every Wednesday, but uh, the last couple of years we haven't been as um, strict about it, but um, we all love painting outside. And a lot of these are, you know, painted on site, you know, throughout Delaware and the um, Maryland Peninsula. Um, we kind of go within an hour of Dover for most of the things that we do. So the, um, not sure exactly, different things like that. I'm also a writer. I was been published a couple of times and I do a lot of the collage work has my poetry in it because that's uh, one way to sell poetry because <laughs> there's not a huge market for poetry these any time, but you know, but when it's with a piece of art, people are a lot more inclined to buy it. And um, some of the prints I do, I, um, I've done about 30 limited edition prints at this point. And they're mostly the local scenes, um, like Dolly's is one that I did in like around 1999 or 2000. And because it's folk art, I usually have the humor in it. And what I did with this one, the D had fallen off of Dolly's. And um, I always look for something unique to, do the historical significance of it. So that one, I also did, um, you can't have dollies without Ollie's or <laughs> Grotto's pizza. So I did um, Ollie Otto because it's, um, I took the GR off of Grotto's, so it's Otto's pizza and Ollie's. <laughs> so anyway, it's kind of the, um, the two iconic places that used to be at the beach all the time. And, um, I, and like I said, I've been doing that about 35 years. The first one I did was in 87 and um which was spence's bazaar and 
I've actually done that one twice. So, um, and this was one of the collages that is one of my favorite poets, Lucille Clifton. And when you read the poem, it's one of her little poems, she writes very short poetry. But when you read the poem, you're getting the experience of what it is to write the poetry and also understand it. It's kind of hard because it's all written together and it's, it's the same process you kind of go through mentally when you're writing a poem. So everybody that's tried to read it, it's, it's interesting because they realize, oh my gosh, this is harder than it looks. So anyway, it's, it was like an interactive piece you know, for the artist to do. And then um, this is the main gallery in here, and um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a hodgepodge at this point because I I have the twelve pieces that have never hung, and I do want to hang them in here after we've had the, the show. We'll probably have the show at the library um, once it's back open again, and we can have the poets because the the um, poems that were created will also be hung with the artwork. So it'll be like a really nice experience for the viewer. And the rest of it is pretty much mine. Um, we do have an artist who, um, we're helping the family sell some of her work. Um, and um, she's, she was very prolific, but then she got Alzheimer's. So we do have some of her work also. And then, like I said, mine is just, at this point, it's like a hodgepodge. <laughs> um, I kinda, I'm kind of behind, there's a lot of gaps and stuff. Um, I haven't had a chance to get things framed as much, but um, you can tell like this was another project that didn't get to um, pan out. It was the, um, a graduate student was working on a, her thesis or whatever, her paper, and it was on the ghost trees of Delmarva. And um, that's like a huge issue right now because the uplands are being flooded so much by the salt water and it's just instantly almost killing the trees and they become almost overnight, they turn into white dead trees. And so that was one of the pieces for that. And then also one of my abstract pieces I love to do were the horseshoe crabs. I refer to them as our blue bloods because their blood is blue. And I've been doing them on the spider side because it's they're just so interesting looking on that side. So. Um, so that's kind of one of my things that I really like to do also, is capture Delaware. And um, this is <laughs> such, I'm so like, oh gosh, I need to get in here. I've been using, um, this is our Annie Jump Cannon room. And so mostly I do the local things. Um, like some of the works I'm working on right now, is I love doing woodburn. I've done probably woodburn like 10 or 15 times. And I like painting the green and the beach. and the dogs <laughs> um, and these are my some of my original prints that are for I mean the Spencer's Bazaar and the Old Overdies or um, and the 4th of July one or the originals that I did the prints from and those three originals are for sale they're kind of my opus works that um, and the governor's been in a few times so I'm working on him especially to buy the 4th of July because that's like my favorite and then um, I also work on the, the driftwood. I've been doing the Santas for about, um, I guess about 25 or 30 years. I paint on the conchs, um, which are the, the tree mushrooms, some people call them, but they're really, conchs is their official name. And I used to get these from a guy in Maine. And then my hunting friends that hunted in Pennsylvania would get me some. And they're just so cool. Um, but it's kind of a wreck at this point. I had to clean it up. But anyway, the, um, but I do the Santa drift, Santa's on driftwood. And, and I call those watermelon slices. Um, because normally what I do is on one side I paint the Santa. And the other side I paint the watermelon. So you can, if it's on a mantle or a shelf, you can just turn it around you know, for seasonal. And um, so anyway, I've been... And then this kind of ended up here. I'm like, don't ask me why. <laughs> I forgot to clean that off. But anyway, um, but you can tell there's Christ Church down there. And um, and then the sunflowers are real big. We um, go out to um, Pfeiffer Orchards every year to get the sunflowers because they plant like 10 acres of just sunflowers. And it's so cool to see those. 
So that's been real popular. And the blue hens, I do a lot of the blue hens because that's, um, even though it's the rooster that everybody paints, but, uh, but you know, we won't go into that. <laughs> but, but anyway, the, um, because that's so iconic that, you know, a lot of people for gifts and going away, they want to do that. So, and then of course the favorite place over here is Bombay Hook. We love it out there. Um, we have all the, um, I just like being on the bay side or the, or the beach. That's like my two favorite places to paint is um, get me near the ocean or get me near the bay. And um, so in a lot of them are the, you know, because the clouds up there are just so great at Bombay Hook because there's really nothing except the marsh and the, the clouds. So it's really nice. And then Mount Cuba, the, the one up top is um, one of my favorite paintings. And that is um, Mount Cuba up in Wilmington. I've painted up there like probably 10 or 15 times and it's just so beautiful. I mean, you can't believe it's an artificial pond. It's one of Delaware's really hidden, hidden gems. And um, we just love painting up there. And then that's pretty much, um, you know, I did lay out my palette just so you could see. Um, I use it's, um, the Impressionistic Palette by Lois Griffel. Um, I studied with her up in Cape Cod, and um, she's one of the best in teachers of Impressionistic painting that I've ever studied with. And um, I kind of lay it out the same way every time. I have the, the cools and the warms and then the neutrals in a little pile. And so, and I'm trying to finish up Woodburn. It's um, Woodburn at Christmas, so I'm trying to get that finished for this year. So okay. and that's um, that's kind of what I do, and I don't know if that's enough. <laughs> but you know, I thank you for coming. And I, um, you know, we're on State Street on the corner of the Green and State Street. If anybody wants to stop in. All right, and that was our first artist. I am going to introduce everyone to our curator here at the Bigs, Ryan Grover, who will tell us more about who that artist is and what is this organization that we are working with. Hey everybody. Um, so hi, this is Ryan Grover. I'm the curator at the Bigs Museum. And I, um, uh, well, I'm, uh, Delaware by Hand. Uh, Delaware by Hand started out as its own independent uh, nonprofit organization. Um, and I was a board member along with a number of individuals. And eventually it morphed into the artist membership of the Biggs Museum. And so uh, all the individuals that you're meeting tonight, as well as everybody that you would see on the Delaware by Hand website are all members of the museum. And they are uh, professional and uh, emerging artists of Delaware. Um, it was, uh, when Delaware by Hand was first formulated, it was a way to be able to create a community of artists and artisans within the state so that there would be one sort of one spot where you can go and find individuals who were painting, photographers, furniture makers, ceramicists, uh, basket weavers, um, and really any kind of visual art form. And so, um, and the the concept of the Delaware by Hand has evolved over time. Um, there are a lot of public programs put on by Delaware by Hand artists, both through the Biggs Museum as well as through other locations. Um, we host a couple of sales a year for the members. <laughs> And, um, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, I was a big fan of Delaware by Hand from the beginning because it was a way to sort of, um, to feature those art forms that were be being created in our own backyards. And um, I just felt like it was such an important sort of educational mandate for the Biggs Museum. So I was really happy to be able to preserve it within the membership here at the museum. Um, I wanted to give you a quick look. We're going to share a screen. Delaware by hand. And let's go to the um, member pages. Um, so this is the Delaware by hand website. Um, I really invite everybody um, that sees this and sees um, portions of this in the future. Um, take a look at this website. It's pretty amazing. And um, if you are, if you go to the artists and artisans pages, 
and you can do search by name or search by medium, however you want. Um, the website is designed so that you can look for individual artist names. You can also search by individual media. So you can look, um, you know, if you're looking for a potter or a chair maker or a painter um, within the region, you'll be able to sort of like focus on individuals. And if you go to anybody's um, actual page, just go um, hit on any of the individual artists. So uh, this is Kathy Bushy. She's a painter in uh, Milton, Delaware. She um, shows a lot of sort of local, um, uh, a, a lot of the local sales. You can see her um, in a lot of little gift stores, but you can also find out about her on her own individual page here. Um, you can get contact information, find out her website, whether or not she sells on Etsy, um, and contact with her so that you would be able to uh, follow her career, follow what she's doing, um, potentially even purchase her work. So, um, and this is true of any of our artist members. So um, uh, I forget exactly how many individuals are, but I know that the numbers have gone up to as much as like 130 or 140 members at one time. So there's a lot to look at at this little website. It's kind of a powerhouse. So I think we should move on to the next studio visit. And who do we have up next? I'm Alan Burslam. I'm a ceramic artist. I've been making ceramics for 47 years here in Arden, Delaware, where I was born. Um, I think growing up in the community of Arden was my original inspiration to become an artist. Uh, but I really didn't start working in clay until I went to college at West Virginia University, where I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts. After I graduated, or actually just before I graduated, I came back here and started making and selling pottery at the Arden Fair, which I've done every year except for this year because of COVID. This was the first year in a couple hundred that <laughs> haven't had an Arden Fair. And then when I was 50, the University of Delaware gave me an opportunity to get my master's degree. So I got a master's of fine arts from the University of Delaware. And I just continued to make and sell my pottery. <laughs> so we walk into the inside. You'll see more of the finished things. So this is the cabin in my backyard, where, which is now my showroom, where it's open to the public by appointment. powdered clay where everything starts from. I usually mix it in um, 500 pound batches and in this clay mixer back here after which it runs through a de-airing plug mill which gets it ready for throwing. So this is 15 pounds of clay, which those platters are made from. So this is how much clay it takes to make one of these. Now these are just drying and they're painted with colored clays or slips. So there are many, many, many different processes and glazing techniques that I use. This one is the colored clays which then can be either dusted with wood ash so that the color comes through subtly or glaze put over, which totally alters the colors that you see. Or well, multiple glazes like I usually do. Clay's ability to be manipulated into endless variety of shapes. Um, also, it has such a connection to people in their lives. Once they have a piece, it becomes part of their everyday life for as long as they're able to hold on to it. Many people have told me how much they've enjoyed the pieces over 25 years, whether it's just sitting next to a lamp or a favorite coffee cup they use. And that certainly is part of the draw of making ceramics. This is the electric kiln, which prepares the things for glazing. So these are just dry, they're not dry yet. 
These pieces have been fired one time. So this is called disc pottery, ready for the glaze. And then the main firing is done in a natural gas kiln. It's a reduction firing, which means that you don't completely burn the fuel and the fuel, the unburnt fuel has a stronger affinity for the oxygen in the clay and colors, changes the colors. So it takes about 20 hours to reach 2386 degrees and 30 hours to cool that down. And the kiln will hold hundreds of pieces, including those large platters. And so this is just a reminder as we keep going, we're gonna move straight forward into our third artist of the night. Um, if you have any questions, if you're looking to make a connection with any of these artists, if you're out looking to support um, any of, I believe today is like Giving Tuesday and it was like small, um, like mom and pop store Monday. Um, if you're looking to continue any of your holiday shopping and support local artists and you find any of these artists very interesting and you wanna make a connection, feel free to reach out through the chat um, and we're going to keep going forward. Well, we're going to be taking uh, another informational intermission um, after this third artist. Hi, I'm Deborah Johnson, and welcome to my studio. I'm here with Kristen from The Bigs, and I'm going to give you a little tour and kind of a show and tell of what I do. So. Um, I'm basically a fine craft artist and I work across a wide variety of mediums. So um, I work in fiber and silk and wool and I also weave and I work in glass and um, I do a variety of glass techniques but um, mainly I do um, fused glass so that's what we'll be talking about today. So um, I think it'll be easiest to start with the glass so we'll go there first. So this is some of my glass work. I would like to show you some of my um, glass techniques. So um, my pieces are built up from thin layers of glass. So usually three or four layers. Um, so after this is two layers and then I might add another layer and then I either create the imagery with um, fritz or powders or sometimes I saw the image out of a solid piece of glass. So Here's a background for a face piece that I'll be doing soon. This piece um, was kind of um, a failure. It was going to be this piece, but I didn't like the way that the butterflies looked on the pink glass, so I chose another glass. So um, the piece ended up turning out with um, the butterflies on a clear piece of glass instead. But it kind of gives you an idea of, of how I get started. So this piece is done with glass powders. And I'll show you when it's not finished. So you can see it in like one of the, um, this is about almost done. It's a, it's a midway point. So um, sometimes it takes weeks to finish a piece. So, um, and then here's some of the materials that I use. Like I may make a powder form and then cut it with my scrolling um, glass saw so I can get um, any shape. But sometimes to get more delicate shapes, I use a vitrograph kiln, which is um, a small kiln that's suspended in the air and then hot glass runs from a hole in the bottom. And then I use tools to draw with the glass in the air and swirl it around. So here's, here's like a, but some of the some of the canes can be very long, um, and you can get very delicate. I don't know if you can see that, you can get very delicate canes, and then I use them to draw in my work. So this blue heron has has the outline of the canes and his feathers um, are done with cane work. 
So, which will be a good segue into my fiber work. So a lot of times um, I'll start with an image, like, um, like a blue heron. We had a great blue heron this summer that just was wonderful. And um, he is appearing in a lot of my work because he's really interesting to look at. And, and um, I, I love the form of them. So this blue heron is done in wool and um, on a silk background. And then when, when I finish it, it will be in borders. So this is about maybe a quarter of the way finished. And it will be a large, a large piece, and it's meant to be a wall hanging. So moving into fibers, I'll show you how I do my felted work. So I took some tools out to show you. This is, this is called wool roving, and it's just the raw state of the wool. Um, a lot of people use this to um, spin yarn. So this is the form that it would be in if you were going to spin with it. Instead of spinning, I use this tool and I push it through silk. So basically, um, the, the wool is dyed. I use acid dyes and then it's pushed through silk. Um, it's kind of like paint, I guess. So it's laid out. I use um, foam and I have large foam sheets and then I lay out the work and then using wool that I've dyed, I create the imagery that I want and I push it through the silk with the needles. So that's how that is done. There's a piece over there if you'd like to look at it. Um, white herons that is in progress right now. So. And and again, there's some white herons in the weaving um, that's next to it. So you can see that I kind of um, segue into different media. And I guess that brings us to weaving. Um, I love to weave. Um, it takes a long time to weave. Some of my completed smaller works, and I have some sketches to show you. So you can kind of see the whole prog uh, progress and the process also. So let's look at this one first. This is done with hand-dyed silk thread. And it has just a bit of sparkle with um, holographic monofilament. So I weave with a bundle, they're called bundles, but they're very thin. 11 threads. This is actually the thread over here, and I just take it off and dye it. So you can see how very thin it is. So how the weaving is done is um, when I'm making a weft bundle, if I want to shade, I can just change two or three threads in the bundle, and then I can shift the color. So um, the thing I like about um, small weaving is I can really play with layering, which is what I do with glass. And you can see here where I did color shifting, where there's a ribbon of color that goes through the whole piece, and then it shifts colors. So I was working to get the same sort of layering effect that I get with glass, and I was experimenting to try to get it with thread. So, um, but here's how I did it. This is just the rough sketch. It's just a... Um, color pencil sketch. And then this is the overlay. So when I was weaving, this was behind the loom so that I could follow the pattern. And and it's just basically a, um, so I know where I'm going with the direction of um, what I'm doing. And then this tells me where I'm shifting colors. So this kind of gives you an idea of how it's done. So um, weaving does not let you redo, but you can change midway through, but you once it's woven, it's finished. So um, I really like weaving, even though it takes a long time. It's very meditative and it's very interesting to see the finished piece to me. That would be a good segue to talk about the shibori. So um, there's a piece of shibori behind you on the dress form. Um, and um, sh shibori dyeing is a way of um, adding resist to the silk and the way I do it it adds pleats and color at the same time and I have some pleat pieces in progress that you can look at and I'll show you what this one looks like before it becomes a scarf so this is the silk before it becomes a scarf it just comes off the bolts like this um, and it's turned into this. 
which is pleated and um, it almost has a very water-like feel I think or um, it echoes like leaves it's, it's very natural um, it is washable um, the bigs had my scrubs for a while but now they're carrying my glasswork but possibly they might have them again or you can also find them on Etsy but that is the Shibori dyed silk and this is how it's done the silk is folded and then it is rolled onto poles and then it is rolled with very fine cotton thread. The cotton does not pick up the dye, so it acts as a resist because it's cellulose fiber and I use protein fibers. So um, the, the dyes are keyed to um, only dye protein. So when you take the, um, the string off after steaming it, it um, you, get, you get this. So here's one that's got more color. So, this was originally dyed in shades of pink, and then I poured hot acid dye over it in chestnut, and then when I steamed it and took it off the pole, you can see it has the chestnut patterning. So, um, and then I actually steam them in a homemade steamer, and I'm gonna show you that, because sometimes it seems like artist equipment is so um, mysterious, and it's not. Like, a lot of things you just have to, like, make do, so put my steamer in here. Normally I use it in my kitchen, it's true. But sometimes I do it outside on the patio if it's a nice day, but in the winter time I do it in the kitchen. But um, the scarves are, this is the lid and I have a big pot which I didn't bring in. And then this fits through it and then the steam is contained in here. So the scarves stand up in the pot and then the, the steam, let me put this down. This is put over them and then they're steamed for 45 minutes. And the steam is very hot and it sets the pleats and sets the dye at the same time. So, um, so, um, and then, let's see, we talked about weaving, I think that's it. Oh, one more thing. So a lot of the techniques I do take a long time because they're fine craft. The thing I like about fine craft is that I feel like it means something to make something with your hands. And it says something about what you're making. Um, someone said, and I don't know who it was, to take a day to weave a leaf says something about the importance of leaves. So that's kind of why I, I like to do fine craft. But sometimes I want instant gratification. So this is my instant gratification technique. Let me show you. I started working with Fimo clay, and it's kind of a glass technique. It's um, Millifori, which is a way of making um, making glass cane, and I'm sure you've seen it in Italian glass where they get the little glass flowers and things. So basically it would be a glass cane made like this. I do not have the equipment or technical expertise to do that. However, I really like that technique, so I'm doing it in Fimo. So it's just basically the oven bake clay, and what you do is you create the layers using a pasta roller, and then you make the canes, and it's a very unusual technique. When the canes start out, they're about this big. And then, like the glass technique, you pull them. If you were doing it in glass, you would have a friend that took the other end, and you would pull the cane, and then you would have smaller canes. Um, in, in this technique, you just roll it until it's thinner. And then when you slice it with a razor blade, so you slice thin slices, and then you can roll them out, and use them to create. So the imagery can get big again. Um, and you can layer the imagery, like this one is layered um, with a leaf patterning that I made and the flower. And this white on here is actually clear when it bakes. So, so you get, um, anyway, it, it's nice to be able to make something that I can make in a day instead of in months or weeks. So I was happy to show you what I like to work on. So thanks for stopping by my studio. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to stop for a minute with showing some of our clips inside Artist Studios. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan, who's going to talk a little bit about the museum. And then we're going to take an opportunity to, if you have any questions, 
um, to interact with all of our artists, artists um, and they can answer some of the questions that you have for them, for their work, for their inspiration, um, anything that you have, they're here to answer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Hi again, everybody. Um, panelists, I'm going to ask you to turn on your video feed if you're able to, um, so that we can see your lovely faces, because we're going to open it up to a couple of questions. Um, folks that are in the audience, if you have questions, go ahead and type it into chat, um, and we will um, we will start a um, asking our panelists those questions. So we'll hang out with the panelists for a little bit. We'll talk a little bit to them, and then we will also um, turn back around and uh, watch the last two videos. One of the things that I wanted to um, tell everybody while we are um, getting the panelists ready, um, we are, uh, most of the individuals that you're meeting today have sold at the Delaware by Hand retail store at the Biggs Museum. It's the one place within the state where you're able to find lots of different Delaware by Hand artists all the time. It's a commission-based gallery. It's just a small space that we have within the main lobby. Um, and um, it's one of the benefits of membership to the artist group is that you're allowed to submit things um, to be uh, sold basically um, at a, just a small commission um, within the museum. So it's really, really terrific. And again, it sort of helps to promote um, the Biggs Museum's great interest in showing off the arts of Delaware. So um, it's regional, it's local, it feeds an artist, it's, it's, it's really all good. <laughs> There's Taylor, although Taylor, you're still on mute. And hopefully Alan will be able to join us in a second. So we just saw the video with Deborah and Taylor and Taylor Collins. Um, Steve Datz is here in the green shirt Steve, and he's marked Steve so everybody can see him in that capacity. But um, Steve, um, we haven't seen your video yet. So we will catch up with that in just a minute. Um, while we're getting everybody on the call, I had an initial question that I was really interested in asking everybody. Um, so far, we have seen three studio spaces, two of which were obviously open to the public. So um, Alan even built basically a retail space in his backyard right next to his kiln. So he has this whole like campus situation. Deborah, yours is more, it seems like a private. I mean, it seemed like your studio was probably in the house. And, and Taylor, I know your studio very well. I've been there a million times. Um, so the get in the gallery space. So tell me about, can we just have a little bit of a discussion about the benefits and setbacks about having public studio spaces? Um, well, I had a, a public studio space at the um, Delaware Museum of Contemporary Art, but I found that um, I was wishing to be home more. Um, it tended to be a little commercial and um, we didn't really see other artists. Everyone just went in their private space and worked. Oh, that's really, um, I'm not sure what's happening with my sound. Is that better? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Um, anyway, um, I, I like working at home and my studio is private, but I do have um, people that stop by. So um, I do have people that stop by by appointments. So it's kind of the best of both world, worlds, I think, um, for me anyway. And that's one of the great benefits of the, um, the Delaware by Hand website. Um, is that um, it gives everybody's contact information so it, and it lets you know if it's an open studio or if it's a private studio and then people need to make appointments. Taylor, what drew you to um, have sort of the public studio space? Because yours is not a small venture. No, well, actually it started, there were four of us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, I'm the last man standing, so to speak. And, um, and the thing that, um, all of us had were basically retired. Like I'm in my 70s now, mm. and it's um, I've always enjoyed the history and meeting people and things like that. And so we all kind of had that interest, that, you know, the four of us initially, and um, we just love meeting people in addition to doing the work. And so it's the worst thing has kind of been like you're in the middle of something like when I was doing the collages that was a really big project in in the beginning of the year 
and I had a eight foot table set up in the anti-jump cannon room and I had like nine million pieces of everything because <laughs> it was 12, 12 different works that had to be done and um, people would come in and you're like yeah, you know they're, you're trying to hold something together to glue it and because that's one of the worst things of collage is you know the glue the glue part and um because you want it to stay in a certain position till you get it situated and a lot of times they would want you to help them which is annoying <laughs> but um but it's kind of fun and it and they get to see like I love the little kids that come in because they're like real shy and I always tell them if they can't be the artist because I always ask them if they're an artist and they'll say yes or no and I always tell them if you can't be the artist you have to be the painting. That's your job is to be the painting. Right. And so they always, they think that's cute, you know? And so you get to interact with the kids a lot, which I'm not a kid person per se, <laughs> but um, I do enjoy like giving them the little um, help, you know, help along the way because uh, you know, a lot of them are shy. I was a very shy child, which no one can really believe. But anyway, but, um, but it was... Um, you know, I mean, I know how hard it is to break out of that shell and to ignore the world, um, because when you're a folk artist, especially, you're not, you know, you're not like the real artist, I want to call it, but um, that's why I used to always tell Jack Lewis, um, he was my mentor, and he was a real artist, and I always wanted to be like a real artist, and um, he said, anybody who's doing art is a real artist, so... Um, but, but that's the, the big advantage, but it is a disadvantage a lot of times. And we haven't heard, uh, we haven't seen the studio spaces for Steve and Denise, but do you want to jump in and tell us a little bit about uh, your feelings about public or private studio spaces? Which direction do you think is most beneficial for your practice? Uh, I, I'd like to answer that. Um, I have a private studio in my home where I also, where I do most of my pottery. And then I have a public retail space as well, mm -hmm. um, which is fraught with challenges. Um, <laughs> we've, especially now, um, we've, we've had a, a paint room, paint room pottery studio and walk-in art studio. So in addition to doing uh, paint your own pottery, you can come in and tie dye, make paint canvases, uh, do fuse glass. And, uh, we're always looking to add other things to it as well. Um, but that it's a lot of work. It's, um, it's a, it's a whole career, uh, and it requires, a lot of people to do it and I'm um, I'm finding now how out of practice I am because I, I had I, I still have a very good staff um, we just have fewer of them um, so so it's you know it's different um, the private art studio that I have in my in my basement is where I make all my um, my ceramics and I do other projects as well and you know stuff with wood um, I, I like to plant things and, and garden. So I, I've been doing a little bit of that in my basement as well, which is not really art, but, you know, um, fun. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's pluses and minuses all along the board. Uh, one thing I did, uh, I want to mention is though that when I opened up my, my retail store, you know, it's in a strip mall, um, with other stores around, um, it, that kind of gives you a little bit of a, almost like a little boost um people are like oh you have retail space it, you know you must really be doing this mm. uh, so and that was that was 12 years ago when i did that Fifth, and it's been 15 years for me all, all total now and denise do you want to weigh in on this for, on this topic oh i'm sorry denise you're muted there we go perfect is that better yeah um you mean I, I have my a private studio place by appointment if you want five for that. And you know, for me, I work part-time, so it's you know, it's still kind of part-time. If if you're gonna have a, a retail space, it's definitely a full-time job. Yeah. Yeah. May not always give you the, the time to create. <laughs> we all need gallery managers, don't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I, um, so we did have one question in the in the group that I wanted to uh, put across to you. Um, I noticed that a number of the artists that are involved with this um, uh, 
work across media. Um, Deborah, you're probably the best example of this, at least as far as what we've seen in the video so far, you just had such a range of different things. Do you find that in when you work across media that you are working with a lot of the same subjects? So like, do your subjects translate across the different kinds of things? And I think this probably works within a media as well. If like, uh, for instance, you are doing, um, uh, vessels versus uh, bird feeders, or if you're doing baskets versus sort of sculptural objects, or if you're doing uh, two different kinds of painting, do you feel like your subjects translate across the media? Sometimes. And I think um, a lot of my subject matter is related to my garden or to, um, to nature. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of hiking and um, I spend a lot of time at the beach. Um, walking on the trails at Henelopen. And so I think that um, the subject matter does translate to um, other dimensions. And sometimes I'll see, I'll just use a heron as an example. Um, the heron is going to become a basket because I do um, basket weaving, but it, it's um, right now becoming um, a fiber piece that's going to hang. And then um, I also paint. I started out as a muralist and um, did some large mural projects and then I started working just with large paintings and then gradually I just shifted over to um, glass and clay and when I moved to Delaware I had a hard time finding glass um, so I switched to fibers which I started with as a um, as a child I wove with my aunt and um, there was a lot of um, women in my family that did fiber work. So when I came to Delaware, I shifted to fibers and then um, then shifted back to glass. So I do tend to, to um, shift back and forth depending on what I want to create. Did that, I don't know if that answered your question on um, subject matter. I definitely started to. Does anybody else want to jump into it? Taylor, I noticed that you often deal with a lot of the same kind of, um, a, a lot of the same kind of scenes, whether it's your plein air work or the folk art work. Do you feel like there's a lot of crossover there or do you feel they're very different things? Um, I've, I've always looked at myself, I really wanted to be a writer like for a long time. And um, cause I remember as a kid, it was like, um, I forget the words, es ischemic writing, I think it's called, like um, Cy Twombly uses mm -hmm. it and different people, um, Roland Barthes or whatever, how you say his name. And I remember as a little kid, I just wanted to write so much and I was just making scribbles and just would sit there for hours just making scribbles because I didn't know the alphabet. And so I've always felt like somehow I'm a historian more I, and the art is a form of recording that history because I, I was very lucky that I had a really good memory and I just love like you know cemeteries and where all the names of everybody is and um which is kind of weird because I see people don't want to think about that but um you know it's just the I'm I'm a Deb reminded me of the thread thing like um, I'm a one of my favorite quotes is by um, Timothy Leary and it's like look for the others like everybody has a piece of the puzzle so we're all like the thread carriers you know especially the artists because we're always looking for those connections and that curiosity factor that how's everything connected and um, and I find that you know with with my work I I'm always um, the colors seem to be the unifying thing. I just love all the colors. And um, I got to paint with Earl Abbott for quite a while. And the guy who let me in the class, he, he wanted me to, to spice up Earl and he wanted Earl to calm me down <laughs> because I'm the, I'm the person who uses every color and Earl is much more of a tonalist. You know, he loves the, you know, navel yellow and the umbers and the siennas and all the stuff I can't stand and because I'm a primary person I mean I want my red and my yellow and my blue and my purple I mean you know mix a little bit but it's got to be the colors and um, so that's kind of how I look at it it's kind of like I you know I'm, I'm telling stories with the paintings especially the folk art because that is a more of a folk 
you know, thing. But even with the um, abstract or with the impressionist, I'm getting much more abstract. I like looking at the horseshoe crap underneath, you know, the spider part. It's so much fun. I mean, looking at that part rather than the smooth, you know, part on top. And um, so it's, you know, it's just that curiosity factor and thinking, how did this get here and how are we connected? And, um, you know, it's just that connection thing. That's awesome. So um, I'm going to, I'm looking at the time and I just, I want to be mindful of the time and um, I'm going to jump back to the videos for a little bit. I want to show off the last two videos. We did get another question um, right um, just before, uh, just a moment ago from one of our participants. And I want you to think about this for a second, because um, I know that each one of you is going to come back with just the most awesome answer to this. Um, and this artist, or excuse me, this person um, that asked, she was really interested in knowing what is your Delaware inspiration? How do you translate the little state, the intimacy of Delaware into your work? So think about that when we're watching our last two videos with Denise and Steve, and um, we'll come back with that question. But for the audience that's watching, please feel free to ask more questions because we'll have another sort of question and answer session at the end. Hi, I'm Steve Batts uh, from Ryefield Ceramics. And we're in my paint your own pottery store called Your Creation Station in Middletown, Delaware. All right. So I started out in ceramics at six years old. I was lucky enough all through elementary school, junior high school and high school to have potters for our teachers. So we got on the wheel in second grade. Um, in junior high school, my friend's brother was actually the art teacher and he used to let me come in before track practice and work on the potter's wheel. And then in high school, we actually had a pottery program that I was a part of. So after that was over, I really had no intention of going on to college and uh, stopped doing pottery and started to do electrical contracting work. I did that for about a year or two and decided I really did want to go on to college and ended up coming down to University of Delaware and studying entomology. I was lucky enough to get um, into a program where I did a lot of basic evolutionary research. And what we used to do, we would collect insects, take pictures of them, and then trace them on a computer and use the computer, computer to identify them, much the way you see people using artificial intelligence today to identify people in pictures. Except we did that with insects in the late 1980s. <laughs> After that, I swore I would never work in extension because entomology students tend to come out of undergrads and go into extension work, pest control. And my first job out of college was with Peace Corps as an extension agent doing pest control. So I went to Southern Thailand for two years and did work in integrated pest management and natural pesticides. Uh, again, no pottery. Um, after Peace Corps, I moved up to Bangkok and spent another four years there doing actually HIV AIDS education. Um, and to make a little extra money, uh, I taught computers at a business school on the side. And um, that was right about the time, it was late 90s, I guess, right about the times when computers were really starting to become pervasive. Uh, I moved back to the United States and got a job programming. and ended up in the software industry for about 10 years before I kind of got tired of it and decided I was ready for something else. Um, so I quit my secure, well-paid job and bought an old Chevy pickup truck and started to restore it, intending to pull a barbecue truck. As I was waiting for the wiring harness to come in, uh, I ended up buying a potter's wheel and a kiln. And the kiln came with a bunch of molds and having never poured a mold before, I thought, oh, maybe I'll pour some of these, these molds, some figures, and open up a paint room pottery store. I got through about five molds and realized that wasn't gonna happen. And I started to focus more on my pottery. Um, and that was 15 years ago. So I started teaching myself how to make glazes, came up with uh, glaze recipes that I have refined and still use today. And then I also opened up Paint Your Own Pottery Store eventually, and that's where we are now. So here's a selection of my pottery, and we have a few pieces here that I've made through the years to kind of demonstrate how my work has changed. Uh, initially, I made double wall pieces that I would carve 
and then incorporate them into larger pieces. So this vase is actually a vase that I cut in half and added this donut ring to and carved the outside and put it all together. Um, from there, I started doing more functional pieces such as this picture and really focused on doing one or two glazes that I would dip onto the piece itself. I also would make bowls and plates and serving dishes <clears throat> that were this sort of shape and um, kind of wider, uh, nice to work on and cook with. And from there, I started to move more into traditional bowl shapes, mugs, tankards. Um, I really became known for having big mugs. Um, so I have a few different size mugs. These tankards are the, uh, the biggest, and these coffee mugs are about 16, 16 ounces to about 32 ounces. Uh, the other part of my work that's become really what I'm known for now is <clears throat> this crackle technique on the, uh, on the outside of the clay. The clay is actually cracked as I make the piece. So I'll throw it halfway, dry it a little bit, add the bands of color in an oxide wash, and then use sodium silicate to re-wet the clay without getting it wet. So as I put my hand in to make the shape, the outside dry clay cracks and stretches across the inside wet clay, creating those cracks. Then I'll bisque fire it once, dip the whole piece in glaze and wipe it away from the color part so that the glaze fills in the cracks, fire it again, and it comes out like this. Uh, you can find my work right here at Your Creation Station, 318 East Main Street in Middletown, Delaware. Uh, at this point, the best thing to do is to come into the shop and see what we have out. Uh, we have some pieces in the back, we have some pieces up front, and um, I have some more pieces that I'll be bringing in you know, as we get closer to the holidays. And for people that want to paint their own pottery, when's the last day they can come to paint pottery before it's uh, to have it back by, by Christmas? So as long as the 22nd isn't a Monday, and I don't think it is this year, it would be the 22nd would be the last day you can come in to paint something. You can also order a piece online from our website, yourcreationstation.com, and tell us what colors you want. We'll pack it up, send you a text message when it's ready, come by, pick it up, paint it at home, bring it back, we'll fire it, and let you know when it's ready to pick up again. Hello, I'm Denise Bendelewski. I've been weaving baskets since around 1999. I went to a craft show and saw this lady selling baskets and she offered classes. Her name was Joni D. Ross. She used to live here in Dover. And I started taking classes from her and we just have gone on from there. Um, we've even written a book together on how to make Nantuckets. I do both reed and Nantucket baskets. I offer um, four retreats a year, four days a week. Um, doing only Nantuckets because it's just really hard to get all the basics on how to do Nantuckets just by you know reading about it or going to a convention and doing just a little bit. Um, I, normally I would take like 14 students, but now with the pandemic, I've only been taking no more than eight students at a time so that we can social distance and take it. I did have to cancel a couple of my classes, but I've been able to do a couple of retreats you know, since the pandemic slowed up, but now that it's gotten bad again, that's probably not gonna happen. Um, I do sell my baskets. I primarily sell um, dyed reed and dyed cane for people to make baskets with, but I do have um, a studio that we teach here and all my Nantucket molds and so forth, since they do take molds. Um, these are some uh, reed baskets, and of course they're all free-handed and you fold, um, do them make the shape as you're weaving, where the Nantuckets are molded and they're going to come out the same way no matter what. So this is my, um, my classroom. And this is my store. So I have several, um, I sell kits for people to make their own baskets, or as you can see, I've got some uh, made baskets that are, are for sale. Um, I started doing space dyed 
Cain and Reed, which nobody else had done before. And people have really enjoyed doing stuff with the space side. This is an Nantucket. This will be a 30 inch tray when it's done. What is used is um, called palm cane. And Nantuckets are made with the bark of the cane, where the reed baskets are made with the pulp, basically. And you have to shape your cane, and then you put it on here, get it all set up, and then you just start weaving. Now, primarily, you know, this is a pretty big basket, so it's hard, but it'll go on a stand. I hook it on, the, on here so that I can sit down and weave. Um, other Nantuckets are made um, so that you can sit on a stand and, and sit and weave. So you don't have to stand up, but until I get this one really going and started, it's going to be a backbreaker. And it's just basically over, under, over, under, all the way around. You can put patterns into your baskets where you would go maybe over two, under two, and that gives it more of a, um, a pattern or a texture look, where with the, the reed baskets you might add some color, or like this one it has round reed in it, so that you can make a design with the round reed. Again, a little bit of different texture. This one's just made plain. But um, I can show you some samples of some uh, okay, this would be a design. This is made with um, natural stays, which are your up and down, and then the weavers are done in black, and then it gives it an arrow pattern by going um, over two, under two. And then this one is over two, under two, and you do it all the way around, and then switch back to get the other arrow pattern. And then this is a diamond pattern. And this is made with hardwood stays. And you can, you know, usually oak, cherry, um, maple, or walnut. And those stays have to be pre-bent, so you would boil them, um, shape them to your molds, put a big rubber band around until they're dry, and then you would start weaving. Here's one. This is made with the space dye. And because of the bark doesn't take the dye really strong, but the inside is porous, so then you get a different look on the inside of the basket. It really shows it off. Now here's one where it's actually woven with the wrong side out so that you get that color versus the subtle subtleties. But I've done a lot of different designs with Nantuckets that uh, people didn't used to do. The traditional Nantuckets were made by the sailors and they just did it as simple as possible. They were, um, most of them, they say in the stories that they were uh, barrel makers. And since they're out and most of this stuff comes from the Orient, then they started making stuff to bring back to their um, wives. Here, so this is just a simple twill basket where it's just over two, under two, and you just go all the way around. And this is another one that's made with hardwood stays, so you get more of a color from the hardwood in the background. And this is it. Again, my name is uh, Denise Mendelewski, and I do have a website. It's magnoliabaskets.com. And uh, there's places there to buy the raw materials, and then there's also a place for the basket on the back for the baskets to be. Um, that you can buy the baskets. Um, there's usually just one or, one or two of each basket that's listed. I mean, if you want multiples, I'm happy to make them, but it does take some time to make. And I, do, I will do custom orders if someone wants something in particular that they'd like to do. I had one lady call me and she'd remodeled her house and she had this little space between her um, stove and her cabinet that she didn't know what to do and I made her baskets to fit in that she kept some of her tools in. So we can do some custom stuff if somebody really wants that done. Um, thanks for joining us. We're going a little bit long tonight, but it's um, so interesting to see artists in their studio talking about their craft. Um, so we're going to return to the question that was posed uh, right before we showed our final two artists. And that question was, 
Uh, do you find any particular inspiration from Delaware, its landscape, and its intimacy by virtue of being so small? And let's go ahead and start with um, Steve or Denise, since you guys were the two that we just watched. Um, if either of you would like to jump in to start us off. Sure. Um, certainly, where I, right where I live, um, we get a nice view of the sky. Um, and the sun going down, the colors have always been the inspiration for my glazes and um, trying to catch that image of uh, the shadows of the trees and the, um, the colors in the sky. And uh, I mean, it's not necessarily the smallness of Delaware as much as it's, you know, being here. <laughs> and and seeing this in front of me um, but certainly that that's where i draw a lot of my inspiration from that seems especially true i think with the um with the uh the banded pieces the crackle wear where you get those really su subtle colors and you get that great contrast with those darker shinier um colors how about you denise well i've done some of the same thing as he says with colors around when I've done some of my dyeing, you know, I saw a sunset one day and it's like, oh, I've got to do something with that teal and that orange. And, and so I made, I made a, a color that's called sunset. But um, to get back to what's in Delaware, I've done a lot of market baskets and berry picking baskets and things like that because of the farming that's in and around Delaware. Mm. So I've sold a lot of those type of baskets. Denise, do you ever source your um, the the materials that you work from? Are they ever sourced locally? No, I've done some fun things for myself using grapevines. Yeah, but um, those are kind of mostly like type rib baskets, and they take a lot of time to make. Mm. And so, other than doing something fun for me, I don't I don't use. There's just. I guess if I did more grass baskets, I might be able to do some beach grass and things like that, but I, I haven't tended to do much of that because that's a coiling and it's another time consuming when you're doing that. Mm. And collecting it and drying it, and it can get very involved. You'll end up like, um, with a, a, a campus of- um, Yes, yes. So, sometimes you've got to- Scene and retail and- <laughs> Right. You, you've got to focus on one thing. Otherwise, you just too much. And how about you, Deborah and Taylor? Um, for me, I didn't realize um, that Delaware, no matter where you are in the state, you're only one mile from water. So I think that um, the blues and the greens of the state, especially in the summer, have really appeared a lot in my work since since moving here. Um, just, I love the water. I've never heard this before. And Taylor, you're practically Miss Delaware already. You are the you are the state historian. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I'm Miss Delmarva because I grew up in Ainley, and um, and so it's like down there, the farthest you could be from water was about three miles, um, because it was the everything down there is Bayside or Seaside. Mm. So here it's kind of like you know Bayside is kind of you know whatever, but um, but it's um, it the peninsula is just so unique, and it's. It, it where I live was really the end of the world and I kind of I kind of like doing the art just well like from the historical standpoint because it's it's a very unique culture and um, especially like um, the elementals Jack always called them but like there's a lot of just regular people in Delaware I mean we're not we're not New York City and it's kind of like you can run into your governor and you know it's things happen in Delaware that just don't happen anywhere else. And um, it's just, that's what I like about trying to capture that, the local scenes and stuff like that, you know, with the prints. Excellent. We did have another question. Um, do, um, so I'm just gonna read this. Um, do you have the opportunity or do you intentionally make the opportunity to get together with other artists, not necessarily for collaboration, but to feed off, off each other's creativity? Do you find um, camaraderie with other artists and, and, and where do you find that? I see Alan a lot at the shows, um, but other than that, I kind of work by myself. 
Uh, in my, can you describe what you mean by the shows? Oh, when we do uh, craft shows and, and fairs and stuff, I'll see Alan a lot there, and we always kind of say hi and you know how you doing kind of thing. Um, and, but and, but for the most part, I kind of I kind of work by myself. Um, although certainly in my paint and pottery studio, when people come in, there is uh, there is an, an energy there, and you can see people. Um, you know, helping each other out. It's a, it's a community thing. Uh, it's really kind of fun to see. And I have to apologize for everybody. We did have Alan on the call earlier and he, um, it looked like he had some sort of technical difficulty perhaps. So um, um, I saw a shot up at, the, uh, up at the ceiling and then it went dark. So <laughs> I'm not sure where, oh, I'll, 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 I'm sure everything's fine. <laughs> But um, Deborah, Taylor, Denise, where do you find camaraderie with other artists in the area? Well, we, well, we do have, go ahead. Go, go ahead. I say we do have a Delaware Basket Maker Association. Mm. So we do get together and um, everybody brings their own little thing and we help each other back and forth. And then I've also traveled to other states to conventions and do basket weaving. I teach and sell and, and stuff like that. But the Delaware Basket Maker here in Delaware we're, we're not as active as we really should be, but you know, right now it's kind of hard to get together sure. and really do things. Um, we have a Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen has a Delaware chapter and they meet frequently and we've been having Zoom meetings since, um, since COVID. And um, a lot of us have broken off into smaller groups and we're kind of, um, we just work together and, and talk through ideas, which is really helpful. And also there's some wonderful art leagues here in Delaware. I belong to the Miss Pillion and also the Rehoboth. So That's great. very um, lucky there's there's a real, there's a nice one and in, in, um, pretty much throughout the state, there's, there's guilds and leagues, which are a really great way to meet other artists. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate. I um, was, I'm, um, was the national president of the National League of American Pen Women for, um, two years and I was on the board for I guess about 10 or 15 years altogether and we have local chapters here in the state and they're nationwide and the way I kind of look at it is with as an artist you need that downtime that private time and to get work done and create and whatever but then you really need that camaraderie to come together for the professionalism of it and it also, you need, if you're gonna ever make a living at it of any kind, you need, you need a source where you can, you know, really get your networking together. And one of the things I really liked about um, the, the nonprofit world is that, especially with Penn Women, is that we were in a position to help um, younger people, like, you know, people graduating from college. Um, you could give them letters of recommendation. You could, um, be a valuable source to, you know, people really needing that extra encouragement and um, needing some kind of credentialing and not necessarily, because you hate to say it gets down to what you know, but the more people that you know, especially in the beginning, um, it's very helpful. And that's why I, I feel really sad that nonprofits aren't supported as much as they should be, because um, they the nonprofit structure can bring in a needed funding from foundations and governments and different things like that. And plus it's a place where you can really learn how to run a meeting and how to use your time a little better and how to network. And you really need to get off of the farm. <laughs> I, I don't use that term exactly literally because we're in Delaware, but uh, too many people just never, they, you know, you just, they don't go anywhere or don't experience the greater world. And to me, I mean, you could do that route, but a lot of times you're, if you don't get out and really meet like people from diverse backgrounds and all over, you just don't, your work doesn't seem to grow as much. Mm. And um, I think, and, and like your organization, Ryan, I mean, or, you know, just the bigs is just this little gem, you know, cause it's bringing so much culture to Dover and we need it so much. I just, I can't say enough about your organization, but, um, but the nonprofit worlds really need a lot more younger people and a lot more um, the older people like me that have been out there and are kind of making it. We really need to mentor a lot more people. 
Well, I think that's kind of an eloquent um, spot to end on. Unless we have other questions um, uh, coming in from our panelists, um, I'm going to put this back to Kristen um, and uh, take it away. Wonderful. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you to all of our panelists, not only for participating tonight and sharing your insights, helping us answer questions from the participants, but also showing us around your studios and talking about what brought you into being an artist and why you stay at it today. To all of our attendees, I want to thank you for joining us um, and spending your Tuesday night here. Uh, with us at our virtual bigs uh, talk and tour. If uh, you have any questions, if you want to get in contact with any of these artists and you didn't get the opportunity to jot down their information that showed after they talked, uh, feel free to reach out to us at the Bigs Museum. We'll help put you in contact. Um, and you can always check out our Delaware by Hand website uh, where you can find links to not only the artists we saw tonight and the four who were able to stay and talk with us, um, but also all of our other artists in our community of Delaware by Handmakers. 